Hi, I'm Dr. Mimi Guarneri, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Pacific Pearl La Jolla Legacy Series. This series is about bringing luminaries of health and healing to the forefront. Individuals who have transformed the way we think about treating the whole person, body, mind, emotions, and spirit. The Legacy Series is funded by the Miraglow Foundation, thanks to grants from the Taylor Advised Endowment Fund. At Pacific Pearl La Jolla, we believe that healing people and changing lives comes from the wisdom of all global healing traditions. This series brings to you those individuals whose shoulders we stand on as we practice integrative holistic medicine today. Well, today we have a true luminary. And I can think of no better person than to start the Legacy Series with than Dr. Gladys McGeary. <laughs> now, I met Dr. McGeary in the year 2000. She doesn't know I met her then. <laughs> uh, I was sitting at my first American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine conference, and she spoke. And I thought, I want to be like her when I grow up. <laughs> Dr. McGarry is indeed known as the mother of holistic medicine for her role as co-founder of the American Holistic Medical Association. For people like me that are considered today leaders in integrative holistic medicine, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And you will meet many of those giants through this legacy series. But for me, Dr. McGarry is, can I call you, the Please. giant of giants. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't tell you all of Dr. McGarry's accolades, because it would take hours. But she's past president of the Arizona Board of Homeopathic Medicine. She's a founding diplomat of the American Board of Holistic Medicine. She has numerous awards, pages of awards. But my favorite, and get this title, Outstanding Service for Mankind. Humanity's Outstanding Service for Mankind. Now, if that isn't global, spiritual, and speaks to the service we all want to do, uh, nothing else does. So that was my favorite. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. And Mimi, you know, all of this that I've done th for these many years wouldn't amount to a hill of beans if you didn't pick it up. Well, we picked it up as a group. We did. We, it was needed, and we were there. You know, medicine is in a crazy time, uh -huh. right? Yeah. I mean, and, and you can tell us what it was like when you created uh, the American Holistic Medical Association. Yeah. But when I look today and we see a country with so much uh, unhappiness, yeah. so many people not at peace, and we say, oh, gee, we have all this obesity and diabetes and heart disease, but most of that is be being driven by how we live our lives. That's right. And your whole message from day one has been about lifestyle. Right. And we're so bogged down with fear. Our, all of our people are so afraid. They're afraid of life itself. And our medical culture actually teaches people that. Our language and the work that, well, everything that you and I were taught in medical school has to do with killing. Yeah. It's killing medicine. We kill bacteria, we eradicate AIDS, we eliminate diabetes. I mean, all of these things is where we're, our focus is. And in the process of killing, like always happens when you're getting rid of stuff, you lose track of what you're really trying to do, which is heal people. So the people, the person has gotten lost and the disease has become, become prominent. In fact, all, in fact our, our actual support groups support the, the disease. You know, you have cancer support groups, epilepsy. Where is the person in that support group? They're, they're, they're lost, they're lost. No wonder people are afraid. No wonder the medical profession is totally in chaos because everything, you know, the thing that you and I went into medicine for has mm -hmm. been lost. We, we didn't go in to have fun, or, but we did. We wanted to really enjoy what we were doing. But if you're 
focused on killing, all of us are, are, focus, are suffering from post-traumatic stress. Every physician I know is, because that's where we're told to be and where we're told to be going. And a few years back, <clears throat> well, after we started the American Holistic Medical yeah, Association. Yeah, please do. I mean, what was yeah. that, 1973? 78. 78. That it started. After, and it had been going for quite a long time, I was in the uh, grocery store in Scottsdale one day, and over the PA system, I heard the uh, loudspeaker talking about the, uh, the hardware store down the street, which was announcing itself as a holistic hardware store. And I stopped my cart and I thought, wow, we formed the American Holistic Medical Association to bridge the gap between conventional and holistic medicine. And I thought, well, we've probably done it because it's become a household word, but they don't know what it means. Right. But, that's, but anyway, so we began thinking about that. And I realized that our, I thought our focus needed to shift from killing medicine to living medicine. Right. We shift our focus from killing disease to a living person who then is the one who does the work that gets rid of the disease. Right. So, so I've come up with five L's for living medicine. I love okay. it. Go ahead. The first L is life. If you're not alive, it nothing counts. Exactly. You know, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. The second is love. If you don't love what you're doing, and if you don't love your own body, and if you don't love the whole process, you, re you might heal the disease, but you don't, you might cure the disease, but you don't heal the person. Right. So you have to move, move with love in all aspects of that. The third is laughter. You've got to put some juice into it, because otherwise it's just too dry. Absolutely. The fourth is labor. You've got to work at it. Mm -hmm. You and I both know a lot of people who really believe in the first three. But they don't want to work at it. You know, they don't want to change their diet. They don't want to do the things that are necessary to really get the th bring life back into the first three. And then the fifth is listening. Mm. We have to listen. We're so busy with our medical jargon that we don't even listen to the patient. And we don't listen to ourselves. And we don't listen to the world around us. And so it's time to reclaim these and in the part of living medicine. So, you know, it's been a long journey, but it's, it's, a, it's been a good one. It's been a really good one. Well, and, <clears throat> and you've got us to this point, and uh, it's the reason we created the Academy yeah. for Integrative Health and Medicine. Right. Uh, you know that American Holistic Medical Association and American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine said, let's come back together, right. let's create an academy for the whole country that embraces exactly this philosophy. That's right, that's right. It's exactly this philosophy and looks at all healers. You know, not that's just right. MDs or DOs, but it really does take a village yeah. to inspire someone to go deep. That's right. And to, we all have that healing ability within us. It's the only thing that really does the healing. Right, and how do we put the body in the best place Right. for healing That's and right. and if we're completely stressed out or nutrient depleted or we're not sleeping at night the body doesn't heal and you're scared silly you know right. if everything that you do is 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 frightening to you right. it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't help the healing what's yeah. what's been really uh interesting to me of course is when we went to medical school we were taught to diagnose we're very good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have now 155,000 or so ICD-9 diagnoses. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. But we're good at making diagnoses. Yeah. Uh, and we're also good at put, putting together a treatment plan. But the only tools in our toolbox when we come out of medical school are drugs, yeah. surgery. Uh, we're not really given the other tools. We're no. not taught anything about nutrition. I know no. when I went to medical school, I didn't learn anything about no. nutrition, no. micronutrients, no. the role of sleep, stress, yeah. uh, none of these things, how we live our lives yeah. and the community we live with. That's right. Right? And all we're taught is diseases. We're yeah. taught to diagnose diseases and treat diseases. We're not taught anything about people. We're not taught anything about what makes them function, what makes, brings joy into their lives, what 
makes them afraid, you know? You have people coming in with all of these uh, prescriptions and everything else just scared silly. Right. And you try to shift that, and they, they're, they're so frightened, they, they just really don't trust themselves. My oldest son is orthopedic, a retired orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. and when he'd finished all of his training, he came through Phoenix and he said, Mom, you know, I'm real scared. He said, I'm going to go out in the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hand. He said, I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be afraid. But if you can understand that it's your job to do what you've been trained to do, and you've been really well trained to do the work that you're doing, and then support the patient as they do their own healing, you have nothing to be afraid of. Because, you know, a surgeon can do a beautiful job of pulling the tissue together, but he doesn't do the healing. The patient right. does the healing. Abs you know, that's how I came to healing touch and understanding yeah. healing touch. I would have patients go to bypass surgery. They would have the best that Western medicine can offer. And they would come out and they just, we could say they didn't get their mojo back or they <laughs> didn't get their groove back, uh, but they, their spirit was gone. Yeah. Like the fight was out of yeah. And when I realized that we needed to be doing something more than just all the drugs, yeah. which we were really good at, yeah. Yeah. and I started to have Brownie King do healing touch on all of my patients before and after bypass surgery, and I always said it was the glue that held them together right. because it's healing on not only a physical level, but an emotional, mental, and spiritual level. And those pieces of emotional, mental, and spiritual, and taking care of the whole person, yeah. sort of went out the window. That's and, right. And yeah. they needed the, the, the human touch. They need the human communication. We need each other. Absolutely. Your spirit beareth witness with my spirit. I mean, it's been said since the beginning of time. Right. And we know this. And when we put the, all of that aside and look at the disease, or even the modality which we're talking about, those are secondary. All of the, the therapeutic, I mean, the, the, whether it's osteopathy, homeopathy, right. naturopathy, allopathic, all of these are wonderful modalities, but they're not the primary thing. The primary thing <clears throat> is what's going on within the patient that might allows them to be get, come well. They have to, have, they have to have something to live for. One of the pa things I like to ask my patients is, what do you want to get well for? Yes. Yes. And a lot of them have never thought about that. Mm -hmm. It never entered their mind. So it's a, it's a point at which they have to start thinking about that. Absolutely. And this, I have to say, you're hitting on something that's really important, which is when we started the integrative medicine term in the 90s, and I have to say I was a big part of that, and I didn't know what to call this new concept. I knew I was a cardiologist. I knew I was putting in 750 stents a year. And when you're having a heart attack, you probably should have a stent, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in yeah. all seriousness, yeah. there's a time and place for everything. So I knew that Western medicine can do some things good. But then on the other hand, we were doing nothing to heal the person. Yeah. Nothing to look at, why does this person have heart disease in the first place? You know, are they depressed? Are they, you know, physically uh, not fit? Do they... And why don't they take care of themselves? My colleagues would say, oh, they're never going to eat right, or they're going to keep smoking. Why? Why? Because they, have in, they don't have inner peace. That's right. But none of that was ever part of the equation. And so when I started to look for a word, I said, what can we call it? And we came up with, of course, integrative medicine. But I used to, when I first started lecturing to my colleagues, and I would use the term holistic medicine, yeah. They would look at me like, yeah. like that was a horrible thing. It and was I'd, sinful. It was sinful. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and it's still today. Yeah. When I go out and lecture and I see the word holistic, I see some of those eyes go, yeah. and I say, well, what does holistic mean? Why don't you tell me what holistic means? And you know, they'll say something like, oh, Laetrile, or something totally crazy like yeah. that. I say, no, 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 no. That's treating the whole person. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Don't we all, don't we all want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and we have, and so with this integrative medicine piece, what I'm getting at is we, we sort of confused people, right? Yeah. We, people started thinking it was about acupuncture, so I'm so glad you brought this up. Or it was about uh, take this herb instead of this drug, as opposed to dealing with 
to human being, the yeah. life that they're living, yeah. the, the community they live in, right? The planet they live That's on. Right. You know, that it, it became, mo oh, I practice integrative medicine. I give 10 supplements a day. <laughs> That's not integrative no, no, medicine, no, no, right? No. And it, it comes back to, to the individual because each individual's uh, way of healing and what they're working with is individual. You can't, you can diagnose 10 different cancer patients with the same cancer, but none of the patient's cancer is the same. I mean, it, it's just not, it's not so. So until you look at, or any disease, I mean, use whatever right. you want to, you have to see what's going on with that, that patient themselves. Absolutely. And, it's, it, and the joy of watching the, the awakening that happens when a patient gets it, you know, when they really get, they claim their power and they claim their ability to work with that, the modality goes completely back into the background. They'll choose whatever they choose that works for them. Absolutely. Just like tr choosing the diet that works. The same diet doesn't work for everybody. Absolutely. You try to make a vegan out of somebody that comes out of Alaska who's used, <laughs> right. used to drink, eating yeah. blubber. Ab <laughs> absolutely. Doesn't right. Work. And those, again, just <clears throat> tools. They're all tools in the toolbox. That's right. Uh, but the person is the most important piece. That's right. And really, the will to live. And as you say, why, you know, I, I always ask that question why do people want to live or why do they want to get well yeah and it's never the answers i would think yeah. right it's i'd like to see my grandchild graduate high school or i'd like to go on a trip with my wife yeah. and be able to walk you know it's never oh i want to get a lower cholesterol right <laughs> <laughs> no, no one is saying that no yeah, that's no, not what no, man no. so you know you've had such an amazing career and i'd love to have you talk about a few areas um and you grew up in India, mm -hmm. which is really quite unique. Yeah. Do you think that had an influence on oh, yeah. how you see the world? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. How so? It, well, it really did because, you know, I, I, my parents took their medical work back into the jungles. And uh, so I knew the people. I, you know, I, I spoke Hindustani before I spoke English and, mm -hmm. and all of that. But one of the things I want to talk about mm -hmm is in 2009, mm -hmm. John C. Lincoln Hospital closed its maternity ward. Mm. And our foundation, we're talking about that, we were thinking, why did they have to close their maternity ward? It was uh, financial. They couldn't support them. It was what they were Tell doing. Tell our audience where this hospital is. It's, in, it's in northern Ca um, Arizona. It's in Sunny Slope, mm -hmm. Arizona. So we, we thought, well, you know, all my life I've been interested in birthing. And so I thought, well, you know, this is something that we as a foundation could really look at and begin to think about. And so we began looking at that. And um, in 2010, we got serious about it and we were working, we got a piece of, we, well, we had a piece of property identified that we were going to work with and so on. And that summer, my sister, who is, she's a real old lady. I mean, she's two years older than I <laughs> So she says to me, Gladys, did you, have you read Dad's book in which he was talking about when Mom was pregnant with you? And I said, well, yeah, but it's been years ago. She says, well, get it out and read it. So I did. And my dad had written this little book way back when. And he starts out with, in this chapter on, on when my mom was pregnant with me. He start, says, uh, when our trio decided to become a quartet, which in 1920 was the proper way of saying my mother was pregnant with right. me. Okay. He said we got somebody to come and stay with the children, the other three, and then we took a trip to Simla. Well, all my life I'd heard about the trip to Simla. It didn't make any difference. You know, I didn't. So what? You know, they went to Simla. But then I read a little farther, and he says they got a size, a young man to work with the pony, and he and my mother, you understand, my mother's early pregnant with me, so mm -hmm. it's a good trip for me. I'm having a ball. Yeah. <laughs> so they start out at 7,500 feet. They go down to 2,000 feet. They go up to 9,000 feet. They mm. go down to 1,000 feet. They go up to uh, 7,000 feet and back down and then back up to 7,500 feet. And then he says, 18 days of unalloyed bliss. And I read that and I thought, 
my parents were crazy. <laughs> I mean, this is 1920. They don't have a phone. They don't have cell phones. Nobody knows where they are. And the three of them with me are going this way in the high Himalayas for 18 days. And I thought, they're completely crazy. But then I thought, no, there's something more to this than, than meets the eye. So I got the book out again. And my parents went to India in 1914, and they uh, had to take two years in language school. And then they went up to Rurki, which is where I grew up in northern India, just where this, uh, the Ganges comes out of the Himalayas, near mm. Hardwar and so on. And um, they found that the, in Rurki, there, well, in that part of India, there was no hospital for women. There was a civic hospital, and there was the military, the British military hospital, but nothing there for women. So my parents started this little hospital for women. And they were just, and, and I can remember as a child when they talked about that hospital, it was just with real love and care. They, they really loved that little hospital. Mm -hmm. But then in 1920, the book goes on to say, the church told them that they had to close the hospital because they no longer had funding for that. They could continue the work in the jungles but they had to close the hospital. Mm. So I thought, that's it, you know? Here in 1920, they had to come to grips with a, a, what the rest of their life was gonna be. Was it gonna be uh, coming back to the States and becoming normal doctors, or were they gonna stay in India and do, and I'm so glad that they did that. So the trip to Simla was a pilgrimage. Yeah. It was a time at which they had to get away from everything they was doing in their life and come to grips with the sole purpose that they were in this world for. No wonder it was 18 days of unalloyed bliss, you know. So they came to grips with that, and they stayed in India to do the work in the villages, which I'm very grateful for because I loved that. I mean, it was just wonderful. And my mother went into labor with me at the Taj Mahal. So, you know, I didn't know what... No, she was Just, a real dramatist. Yeah. So, so here we are, and I said, 91 years later, You're in the same I'm being situation. given the opportunity <coughs> to pick up what they were unable to do. So what we're doing now in Phoenix is creating a Center for Living Medicine, which the, folk, the heart of it, in my mind, is the birthing center. But that, you don't just bring babies into this world and then let them be. I mean, right. that's, that's no, I ridiculous. Would, I, would, I would hope not. <laughs> so it's the Center of Living Medicine is, it, it is education and research, but also creating a center where we can integrate the medical process of aging into health. I'm tired of old folks thinking of themselves as obsolete. Right. It's time we reclaimed the health that we have and use what we can. I mean, I can't run upstairs two at a time like I used to, but I can still get upstairs, you know. Yeah, I may so. pull on and work with, you know. It's a matter of using what you've got and being grateful for that. Well, don't you think in our culture we've almost uh, trained people to get old? Oh. Right? I we, mean. We, we worship the youth. <laughs> we, we, right, we worship mm -hmm. youth. The second you so-called retire, which is a term you and I will never understand, right? Um, people don't see you as the wisdom, right? No. All that wisdom, no. all that knowledge, this culture. And, and I see many people, young people come into my practice and they're in their 50s and yeah. they say, oh, I'm getting old. Oh, I have arthritis. <laughs> oh, I have high cholesterol. And I think, you have to be kidding me. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you look at India culture, right? Yeah. They would say, when you hit 60, you have another 40 or so years to go. Yeah. And, and now, and how do you uh, do exactly what you say, be healthy in this process? Yeah, yeah. We don't teach that. No, no. People don't think they can. They right. really have uh, forgotten that they have the power to heal themselves. I talk about it as a physician within them. And my joy is when the physician within the patient wakes up and I can communicate with that because that's a real healing person. Right. That's the healing moment. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's what we affectionately call the aha moment. That is. Because is. when you have that, you know. 
And you can see it happen with patients. It's such a joy you know, when I, they get I had, it. I had an interesting experience today. I had a woman come in and, you know, she had originally come to see me for some bowel issues. And we straightened out her diet and her microbiome with probiotics. And we did all the things we do. Uh, and she said, I had this really bad episode one day. And I said, well, what was the setting of that? And she said, well, I had it right here. And she described the whole thing. And then we said, well, what was going on with your life at the time? Right? And so she started telling me what was happening with her life. And then I said, let me talk to you about the third chakra. Mm-hmm. Right? And people, you know, she didn't know anything about chakras. And I said, well, in uh, Eastern philosophy, we believe the body has seven chakras. And this particular chakra in the epigastric region has sort of these things that we see. She had the aha moment. Boom. She knew exactly <laughs> what it was all about. What it was all about. She said, I got it. And before she left, she said to me, I want to see your healing touch practitioner because I want her to teach me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To teach me. She didn't say I passive, I want her to heal me. She said, I want her to teach me how to to really deal with this. Right. right. right? Yeah. And I thought, beautiful. Yeah. That's yeah. the aha yeah. moment. Yeah. And it brings joy back into our lives. Totally. I mean, it makes our lives worthwhile when we see that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about birthing and birthing centers, uh, I mean, the fact that we are in the United States of America. Are at the bottom of the list. And we don't have a maternity or an obstetrics unit with midwives no. and good care and choices for women in Arizona, yeah. it's mind-boggling to me. It, it's terrible because, you know, what we've done has been to completely take away a woman's power. Women have been, have been having babies since the beginning of time. I mean, we Absolutely. know how to do this. This yeah. is something that we really know how to do, yeah. and we do a real good job of it. Absolutely. As long as we're allowed to do it, and allowed to do it in our own way. But what we've done with medicine is we've made people think that that they can't have their own babies, that we have to deliver them. You deliver pizza, you deliver <laughs> postage, you don't deliver babies. Absolutely. You, know, you help women have their babies. Right. That's you're, our job. Uh, you're really there as an assistant at most. And That's right. Yes, there are some, you know, people will say, well, there are some women who have complications. Well, but so you, you deal with them that. and you have options yeah. and you get women to the right place. I remember when I was in medical school, I was at Downstate. And we, I was put on, in my third year, the OB ward. And I remember I walked in, and there were, it was a city hospital. Yeah. There were women from wall to wall yeah. Yeah. just screaming. And then there was this little door that went to this other space. And so I go in there, and they had midwives. No kidding. Could you believe it? King's County Downstate Medical Center. In wow. The, right. But I didn't even have the wherewithal to say, wow, because <laughs> I was just this medical student. I didn't know. And I go in, and here's the, the midwife room. Looks like a beautiful <laughs> living room and a nice yeah. bed. And, you know, mom is getting an oil massage, and there's no screaming and yelling. <laughs> and even as a student, I kept thinking, I want to go there, <laughs> you know. I want to go in with those gals yeah, that are yeah. delivering, yeah. you know, delivering. But what we've done is we've made it a disease. Uh, absolutely. Right? We made it an ICD-9 code. Yeah. And now we have women thinking, oh, gee, I'll just go have a C-section. Right. I'll time it. And I want my baby to be a Sagittarian as opposed to a Scorpio. You know, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll even or, if they get that far. <laughs> or, right, or I want to work. And yeah. so I'm going to take this week off and no... And I think, you, you know better, but I think our C-section rate is up to like six, 67%. Yeah, yeah. It's this terrible. Is, this is unheard of. It's awful. It, we're, we're, we're doing a very bad thing. There's a wonderful film called Microbirth. And if anybody wants to really find out what's happening in the birthing center, this Microbirth film is amazing. How do we it, get it? Where is it? Uh, it's available through t on the TV. I don't okay. know anything about okay. you, but you can find we'll it. We'll have to track you know, it down. Google microbirth and yeah. pull it up. Right. Because it talks about what the micro whole microbiome is doing. And Absolutely. when the baby is born and breathes in 
that mother's bion. You know, we, when I was in medical school, we tried to keep this area sterile. What a oh, joke. Oh, I know, with iodine <laughs> and all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> Shaving up. Well, yeah. anyway. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, it's really ridiculous. <laughs> totally. Of all the places in the world to try and try keep sterile. Try to keep sterile, sterile it's, right. It's not one. Anyway, but when the baby breathes that in, they kickstart their immune system. Right. And if they're not given the opportunity to do that, they never get it back. They can get some of it back by, bre by breastfeeding and by contact with the mother. But the, but, but the actual kickstart that should be gotten when the baby is going through the birth canal is lost. And it doesn't just lose it for that baby, it loses for her child and for her child. I mean, this is changing generations of, of health. And, and don't you think if women were told that, or they were told that these children who don't go through the birth canal uh, have higher rates of atopic dermatitis, right. of asthma, all sorts of things that women, it's Diabetes. one thing, women, yeah. Yeah. Women would make a different choice, right? Right. As long as, it's different if you're in an emergency. Yeah, we that's all understand totally that. That's totally. That's t about 5%. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I, I think that this is an area, and I, and I hope, and I know you, you're doing this in your work. Yes, oh, absolutely. That we raise the level of awareness. We have to, we have to, because it's, we're changing our, our human consciousness with what we're doing to our birthing. So, uh, you pioneered a lot in the birthing realm. You were the first to put dads in the birthing room, yeah. is that true, yeah. right? Yeah. And tell us what conscious birthing is. Well, I'm calling it loving birth now because mm -hmm. we tried calling it conscious birth because we wanted people, women, families to be aware, preconception, that what you do with your body before you get pregnant, what you do with, at the point of conception even, is important and during the pregnancy. So conscious birthing is being aware of what's going on. Our problem was that when we tried to call it conscious birthing, people thought we were talking about abortion. It was the strangest thing. We said conscious birthing, they said, oh, you're talking about abortion. No, we no, weren't talking no, about abortion. Yeah. We were talking about conscious birth. So finally, I had a dream one night in which I was talking to a group of women, of our group that was working with this, and I said, well, I've got the answer. The answer is loving birth. Yeah. So we're not con now we're calling it loving birth because I like that. it's it's it totally changes the whole thing. Yeah, you yeah, know, totally. Yeah, and and also you know loving oneself. Absolutely, caring and loving this baby, baby, that you, this gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So the center that you're creating, uh, going to create. Well, let's talk about it as if it's created because yeah, I feel well, like it's, it's created it in is. our minds. That, yeah. That's where we that's start, right? right? We right, just right. and it just becomes part of reality. Right. Uh, just walk us through what that would be like, just so we know. Well, the per moment the person steps on the property, healing starts. It's like here, hmm. when we drove up into your driveway, we could feel that. You know. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, because healing st places are sacred. Yes. And when you find a sacred space and you move into that, the healing starts. So the, as soon as the person comes in, the, it, the healing starts. We're, lo we're looking to have, uh, like I said, a birthing center which would incorporate all of this education about birth and, and so on. But not just that. We want to have a research center where the, um, not just birthing, but whole, the whole new things that are coming in that are not, well, let me back up a minute about that because so much of the, the research that is done around the world in our country is downplayed and if it wasn't in Harvard or, or Cornell or something, we consider it foolish. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. Anyway, we, there are research projects and things that are being done around the world that are really, really important in the field of medicine. We want to pay attention to those. We want to have an educational area where we can communicate this with people, the whole process, and then the whole concept of living, uh, of aging into health, so that we have people who understand that no matter what age they are, they can be healthy 
at the level that they choose to be healthy right. and then work with that. So instead of having a place where you go because you're sick, yeah. you go for a, a place where you need to reconnect to your life force. My next book is going to be Dovi's Path to Enlightenment, Dealing with the Chakras. I think it's great. Yeah. It's really remembering who we are. Yeah. And yeah. it's that connection to all that is. That, that's and right. That's where the, and knowing that we have everything within us to that we healing. need. Yeah. Uh, but you said it in the beginning. We frightened people so much that's right. uh, that by the time you and I see someone, who's literally had their <laughs> wits scared out of them, they, uh, almost, they don't almost believe. They, they've lost. And you have to really get that trust yeah. and spend the time. You have and, to. And that yeah. can't happen in a 10-minute no, no, appointment. No. It needs a center where people can come to. Right. That that becomes, like we have here, this is people's health home. Yes. The focus is on restoring health. Absolutely. Right. And, and we have to communicate with them at that depth level. We, mm -hmm. But we have to be clear within ourselves right. before we can really do that too. So it's not just a healing process for the people who come to us. It's our own healing process. It goes on all the time. And that doesn't stop. Absolutely. That, it doesn't stop. It's part of what makes it a healing center. So, And we're, we're just in the process of pulling that together. I've been working on, we know we've been working at it for a long time. But time is irrelevant, you know. When the time is right, it happens. Well, you've done so many things, and it seems like to me that you just manifest them. Yeah. You think of them, and they come to fruition. I mean, you, you co-founded the Academy of Parapsychology and Medicine, yeah. right? You created the first clinic uh, based on the work of Edgar Cayce. Yeah. I mean, you have really, uh, and if I'm correct, wasn't hypnosis and the training Yes. Uh, in hypnosis, sort of birth it at your in table our, at some point? In our living room. Yeah. In your living room? Yeah. I yeah. mean, these are first after first <clears throat> after first, all of which today we sort of consider, you know, oh, that's part of our culture. That's, yeah. that's part of what we have. And sometimes we forget, my goodness, this came from a visionary who saw the need. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's true leadership, right? When you see a need and you do something to, you, t you don't see it as a, uh, you see it as a challenge and yeah. an opportunity. And something right? that's needed. Something you that's know, needed, uh, right. These, these are areas that were presented. I, I, the way I look at it, I had the opportunity at, at the right time, these things were presented, and there was an opportunity to do that. And, and the world needs it. It really needs a paradigm shift in medicine. One of the things that we really need to do is reclaim the fem feminine face of medicine. Absolutely. And I think that's what you and I know a lot about. <laughs> well, I, I, I totally uh, agree 150% yeah. women, and this is not to say there aren't wonderful male health practitioners, providers, yeah. and physicians, uh, but women are the true healers, yeah. Yeah. right? And when you look at any culture yeah. and you start to follow uh, the matriarchal lineage, Right. Yeah. Um, and even if you go to Hawaii, right, and someone is ill, the first thing they'll say is, "Let's go see Tutu," yeah. which means grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's where the wisdom is sitting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, unfortunately, as women, uh, we sort of have taken almost a back step. We have. I mean, when I look at you, 1943, you went to medical school. Yeah. Were you the only female in your class? No, or I close went to Women's to it? Medical College. You in went to Women's Medical yeah. College. Okay. But then it closed its doors. You know. Okay, because... it doesn't exist anymore. No, no. And then you did your internship at Deaconess, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And how many men were in that? Pro women were in that program. I was the first woman to. I, right. I slept on an X-ray table because they had no bed for me. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you know you so uh, slowly, uh, where we have to. Uh, transform and the truth of the matter is the paradigm shift not only for healthcare but I believe saving the planet oh absolutely and for peace absolutely. on this planet I mean if if I can do one thing it would be to mobilize all the women in every country absolutely and say no more 
Yeah. No more no war. more. I'm not sending my kid to war. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to change the way I'm thinking, and I'm going to come from love. Absolutely. And if we can mobilize every woman to do that, I believe we can have peace on this planet. Absolutely. And it's the way it's going to happen. I am. Because we women need to really take the lead in that. You know, we can sing lullabies to our babies, <laughs> and that, and we can sing lullabies to the people who are dying. I mean, we can sing, uh, whether we can sing songs or not. Uh, I had a fascinating dream of, well, a few weeks ago, which I, I, I cherish this dream because it, in the dream, I was in India. I was nine years old. I knew I was nine years old. I knew it was a Sunday morning. And we were in, our, in the camp, on, in the tents. And in the dream, I'm watching this nine-year-old Gladys come out of the tent. Mm -hmm. And since it's Sunday morning, on Sundays we were supposed to uh, read the Bible and do the catechism, and we weren't supposed to sing uh, any so sim hymns, any songs except hymns and budgeons. Mm -hmm. And I had other songs about caterpillars and things that I liked to sing. So <laughs> in this dream, <laughs> I see this nine-year-old kid come out of the tent, you know, and I'm checking to make sure that nobody sees me because I could get tattled on. So I come out of the tent and I climbed my tree. I always had a tree. So I went to the highest point in that tree and I'm sitting up in that tree and I'm singing my songs. And, um, and I know I'm bad because I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to be singing these songs, but I'm up here and I'm singing. But the nice thing was that Jesus was up there with me too. So I would sing some of these songs that I was singing. Then I would check with Jesus, and I would sing the song about into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And that would make it OK, so I could go on singing, singing the song. Singing about your caterpillars, and, right? Yeah. And, and he was getting as much fun out of this as I was. Oh, and I'm, I'm watching sure. this, in, uh, this girl sitting up there having fun with Jesus. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was there. So this dream says to me that one of the things I had to learn was to sing my own song. Yeah. And I had to make it so that it connected with my spiritual roots, no matter what they were, and no matter who was saying I had to do what. I mean, this, I had to be in the treetop in order to do that. And so that, I, I love that dream because it, it, it kind of brought into focus my life that I had to learn to sing my own song, and Jesus kind of liked it. You know, uh, yeah, he and yeah. I were having a real good time. You got there. approval on that one. <laughs> well, I, I can think of no one, really, who has sung their own song. Oh, and, and in all seriousness, as a result of that, there are many, many organizations, from the Academy for Integrative Health and Medicine, to parapsychology medicine, to the homeopathic groups, uh, to hypnosis groups, I mean, that really owe their roots to your vision and to the fact that you sang your own song. And we want you to keep singing, <laughs> absolutely. You. And uh, the Living Medicine uh, Foundation and the New Birthing Center uh, is a piece of that. Yeah. It's yeah. just the next, the next piece. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, I want to add that what you are doing is so pivotal to this whole thing. Because not only are you a cardi cardiologist, but you have taken the heart of medicine and really lifted it up so that it has become where healing really happens. Mm -hmm. Healing doesn't happen. It has to start, you know. Spirit is the life, mind is the builder, and the physical is the result. But the spirit is the life comes from the heart, but the mind has to build on that. And that's what you're doing. So I, I just, I love you for doing that. I just think it's, it's just absolutely wonderful. Well, it's just wonderful. Well, thank you. And I, I really think that our work is ultimately to bring the heart yeah. back into healing. Absolutely back into the medicine that we both love, which is why we became physicians. Absolutely. We did it to serve. We did it to alleviate suffering. That's right. And to have the heart uh, back in and to reconnect 
uh, with the people who come to us. Absolutely, with their hearts hurting. Hurting, yeah. exactly. They may not have heart disease. No. But they've got heart disease. Absolutely. Because their hearts are, are, are injured. Their hearts are injured, their hearts are broken. And the medical profession is injured. You know, we yes. have in our medical profession post-traumatic stress at, at the basic level. Totally. We all are working with that. And, and, I, and I have to say, I don't know if you know this, I just wrote a book with Mark Tagger called Total Engagement, which is a book for physicians and healthcare providers to exactly address this issue, is how do we heal the healer? That's right. Right? How do we find meaning in the work that right. we do? How do we go from feeling like we're just fixing problems to truly serving yeah. and have the joy back in medicine? That's right. Uh, and that right now is something that we really need. We really need. For, for our colleagues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I can't thank you enough. I love you. Love you too. <laughs> Lo love is all there is. It's, I mean, is. at the end it of is. the day, and yeah. if you would, just give us your five L's one okay. more time okay. so that I can steal them for all my talks. Okay. But I will always give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the credit. Life, we have to be alive. Love, it has to be full of love. Laughter, labor and listening. Beautiful. Those are the, that's the basis, and then you can build on it. We were say, talking to somebody today, and she said, yeah, but you also have to have gratitude. And I said, absolutely. That's what you build on these five L's. Yeah. Each one of us has to build our own structure on the basis of that. Absolutely. Well, that's beautiful, Dr. McGeary. Thank you so thank you. much for thank your time, you, for your work, your energy. We're here in full support of you, and uh, I hope to have you back here in La Jolla, Pacific Pearl La Jolla, again. And right. I would really love if you're up ever for coming and teaching a class or anything that inspires you, uh, we'd love to have you back here. Thank you. So thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.